Hi everyone. Today's lesson is about Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio. He's arguably one of the most important painters of the Baroque era and created a lot of different concepts for painting that were used by many other painters that we will discuss um, in this class. So today's lesson is going to be about some of the earlier paintings by Caravaggio. A lot of art historians get caught up in the biography of Caravaggio rather than in talking about his work because his life was so interesting and intriguing. He was, um, he was a person who was born to a father who was an architect and for all intents and purposes, he seemed to be leading a normal life that would lead him to becoming a great painter. Um, however, an early published notice on him in 1604 reads, after a fortnight's work, he will swagger about for a month or two with a sword at his side and a servant following him from one ball court to the next, ever ready to engage <clears throat> in a fight or an argument so that it is most awkward to get along with him. His family <clears throat> moved to the town of Caravaggio, which was in Northern Italy. And this is where his name comes from. Um, he apprenticed with Simone Petrizzano and afterwards worked in Giuseppe Cesari's factory of painting before finally breaking out on his own. But his personality was so impatient and boisterous that it was he had a hard time keeping down a job and his reputation suffered a lot. Um, in fact, he had a reputation for getting into bar brawls and fights very often. In fact, later in his life, he got in a lot of trouble because he ended up accidentally killing a man uh, in a bar fight. And this led to him having to flee Rome and move to Malta, where he uh, joined a knighthood. Um, there he made a very famous painting of uh, the, the St. John the Baptist that we will look at today. Um, when he finally got his pardon or his pardon was being processed by the Pope uh, and he was returning back to Rome, he died under very mysterious circumstances. So um, he was also defrocked from the knighthood for being rotten and foul. That was the words that they used. So Caravaggio's personal reputation um, sometimes overshadows his, uh, the in. in the incredible quality of his work. But in this lesson, we'll be focusing more on his work than on um, his personality, his colorful personality. The first painting we're looking at is called The Card Sharps, painted in 1594. So just take a moment to look at this painting and notice all the details that catch your eye. Um, you look at the color of the costumes, the, the hats, you try to figure out what's going on. Most importantly, ask yourself, who is the victim here and who is the villain? So it would seem that the young boy on the left side is the, vi is the victim and the boy on the right side wearing the yellow vest is the villain. A card sharp is someone who um, is skilled at tricking people in cards on the street to steal their money. So the boy on the left is obviously a wealthy boy based on his clothes and his hat. And he's obviously not very street smart because he's being tricked by this card sharp and his accomplice, the old man behind him, who's peeking behind and telling him which cards he has. And clearly these are street urchins because when you look at his gloves, they have holes in them and uh, their, their clothes have rips in them. So it's clear that they're not well-to-do people. But if you think a little bit more carefully about it, the boy on the left is just learning a very expensive but valuable lesson in street smarts. But what about the boy on the right? I would argue that he is the true villain, the true victim of the scenario because he is suffering um, at the hand of the old man who has corrupted him into this lifestyle of debauchery and corruption. Um, instead of spending his youth learning a skill or um, spending his energy trying to become excellent at a craft or trade, um, he is spending his life becoming a card sharp and putting himself in danger with the law. You'd imagine that knowing about Caravaggio's life, he would understand and empathize with such boys and realize how much their life is ruined by engaging in debauchery. It's very interesting that Caravaggio was self-aware seemingly in his paintings about the corruption of the youth, but 
at the same time he engaged in it himself. Um, so you can also see because of the way that the card sharp is posed, his back is facing toward the audience. And when your back is exposed like that, it makes the character seem more vulnerable because he doesn't see you and you could ostensibly kill him more easily. So there is this entire psychological game going on with the card sharps uh, picture. And this painting actually brought Caravaggio a lot of fame and success as he finally became noticed as a, um, as an incredible painter and started to get more and more commissions and more wealthy patrons to support him. So the corruption of the youth continues in Caravaggio's work and doesn't just stop with a card sharp. So this second picture that I've put up here is from a painting called Bacchus. Bacchus was a Greek, uh, Greek god of wine and self-indulgence and there's another version of his name called Dionysus. Um, and you can see that based on the props around him, you can kind of recognize what he's dressed up as because there are fruits, there are wine, but this is another small example of um, a theme in Caravaggio's work of another type of corruption that happened to the youth, especially to young boys, where they would be corrupted by older lascivious men who had homosexual desires and would sexually exploit young boys for money um, or power. And so you would imagine that this model would have been one of those boys, because when you look at his expression, there's a lot of sadness. Um, and I've written here, his empty and sad expression as he poses for consumption, like one of the fruits around him, puts on display an unflinching realism, the truth of the ugliness of Italian society. And elements of this can be seen today with pride parades and child drag queens who are paraded by their parents and by um, unscrupulous adults who want to sexualize young children and take advantage of, the, of their innocence. Um, so this boy in particular, let's look at the whole painting, try to see what expression and feeling this painting gives you. Try to consider what, does it make you feel comfortable or uncomfortable? Do you think this boy is happy or unhappy? And is he judging you or is he pleading with you? So there is this duplicity in the expressions that reveals that there's more than what is on the surface in, in the props of this painting. Especially when you look closer at his face, it looks kind of made up like he's wearing lipstick or his eyebrows have been done. Um, he's a very beautiful boy, but he's he is definitely not in um, doing something that a child should be doing. So especially because the nudity, the way that Caravaggio has painted it, has made it so overt that this is something wrong going on here. So Caravaggio wouldn't have been the first artist to paint young boys in revealing clothes in a painting, but he is definitely the first one who has called attention to how disturbing or perhaps wrong that is because of the way that he's painted him. So normally you wouldn't have this uncomfortable expression on the boy. And this expression is, I would say, is the central piece of the whole painting because he is simultaneously judging you for looking at him and also uh, inviting you to join him. And it's also, in, uh, his eyes are sad and empty. So you can kind of imagine the things that he's been through. So Caravaggio is at once, he's exploiting the boy by using him as model in his painting. But on the other hand, he's also lamenting uh, um, this kind of exploitation and condemning it. So this is one of the paradoxes that shows up continually in his paintings where he both condemns and also engages in the same kinds of vices in his work. Um, when we look at his hands and his face, I, as I've said in the slide, it's that they're so red because he would have been playing outside and wearing clothes. And that makes the nakedness of his body seem all the more disturbing and stark and make you, makes you realize what's really going on with these models behind the scenes. Um, and he's just a boy wearing a costume. He doesn't have any of the, um, Caravaggio doesn't actually paint him like a god. He paints him like a boy wearing a costume because um, it doesn't give off that feeling of radiance 
and divinity that other paintings do when they de depict gods or Greek gods. Um, and it kind of, uh, he also inculpates you as an accomplice. So this is another theme in Caravaggio's paintings where the witness of a crime somehow becomes complicit in it because he watches it happen without doing anything about it. So Caravaggio asks us the question, to what degree are we responsible for the crimes that occur in our society? And are we responsible for stopping them? Um, So Caravaggio asks us when we, when we see or witness this kind of corruption and exploitation happening in society, um, are we somehow complicit in, in it happening because we didn't stop it? And this is the kind of guilt you feel when you look at Caravaggio's paintings when he depicts horrifying things that do happen in society. Another example of the exploitation of the youth would be the musicians painted in 1595. But this painting is not simply about the moralism of youth exploitation. It's also about shadows. Because when you look at this painting, um, the first thing you notice is how close all the boys are to each other. Um, and it's very confined space. And he creates this effect because he cuts off the painting um, right at their heads and they're the edges of their limbs. So it looks as though the paint, they, they are very large in a small room um, and you're confined with them because they're so close to you. And this kind of composition was uh, quite new. In fact, if you look at earlier paintings, um, earlier Renaissance paintings that would have tried to capture a similar scene, they would have made the characters look very flat or two dimensional and would have had a hard time creating the volume of their bodies. Whereas Caravaggio succeeds in this. The dazed expressions of the youth indicate that they're, they don't really look happy. They look drunk or dissociated. They don't look very blissful, which is very interesting because normally when you have paintings of young people playing music, you show them as being happy. Um, and even the boys in the background are, have a similar expression of being dazed, confused, and in a trance almost, like they've taken some kind of drug. So Caravaggio always like adds these undertones to his paintings. Of course, that's not the main reason, um, that's not the main um, center of his painting, but it is unavoidable when you see it. Um, and once again, the shadows are what create three-dimensional volume of their bodies. And this was a very um, important development in his art technique. Um, you can see how the shadows of the instrument fall on, his, on the boy's clothes and the shadows from one boy's shoulder um, obscure the other boy's hand and puts it in the shadow. So it's the shadows are what actually sculpt things into three dimensions in a two dimensional plane like a painting. And uh, this is how sometimes we say, sometimes it is said in art criticism that painters and sculptors have a lot in common. Um, and I think this painting is very beautiful actually because of the flow of it. So it flows from left to right with his scarf, uh, the red scarf that leads into the white scarf that swoops upward and um, the boys look very similar to each other and um, it kind of adds to the harmony of the whole painting and uh, the musical instruments stimulate your other senses as you imagine what the music would sound like, what the grapes on the left would taste like. So it is a painting also about self-indulgence and about just enjoying your life. So Caravaggio very much loved to enjoy his life, but he also suffered the consequences of overindulgence and enjoying his life a little bit too much. So this is a very great balance that his paintings introduce. Another, now we get into more of Caravaggio's religious paintings. This painting is called um, St. Francis in Ecstasy painted in 1595. So take a moment to look at this painting and think about where your eye travels and what's the most interesting thing for your eye to look at in this painting. 
So this painting is uh, was made uh, as a commission for the Cardinal Del Monte, who's one of Caravaggio's primary patrons and supporters. And it depicts the story of St. Francis of Assisi receiving the stigmata when he was praying in the wilderness. Um, and in, in the record that was written about St. Francis of Assisi, there were um, a lot of fire. It was a fiery figure with wings nailed to a cross of fire. Two flaming wings rose straight upward. Two others opened out horizontally. Two more covered the figure. Um, and the fiery image impressed itself onto his body with joy and pain. Um, so there were the description of the event includes a lot of dramatic imagery, but the painting of the event that Caravaggio has made does not include that kind of imagery. So it's very interesting to consider why he might have done it that way. In fact, the painting is very calm, like St. Francis of Assisi has just um, fainted or fallen asleep and the angels just caught him very gently. So it's a very quiet painting. In fact, the whole background is very quiet as well. There's just a few brush strokes to indicate that there's some kind of forest or lake behind him. Um, and the angel itself also doesn't look very angelic. Uh, it looks once again, like a child that's been dressed up like an angel um, and is wearing fake costume wings. Um, and I think this helps to break the illusion a little bit of the magic and is one of the things that Caravaggio was criticized for by people like John Ruskin that his paintings were far too realistic and they, it kind of made them less magical and, and uh, tasteless to look at. But I think that's a matter of taste and uh, that's my opinion about John Ruskin's critique of Caravaggio. Um, I think that this might have been an event that happened after the fiery um, image and all of the dramatics of St. Francis of Assisi's um, experience. And this is just, just afterwards when they're all winding down from it. So I think that was really interesting to, to display. And once again, it looks like the main focus of the painting is the subjects and they kind of emerge out of the shadows like they're sculpted by it instead of every single aspect of them being visible to the viewer. Um, in fact, you can't even see the uh, angel's other leg or um, the, the other wing behind him. It's kind of like his head is also, the back of his head has disappeared. So it's like he's just coming out of the darkness and it's, there's a, a strange divine light that's shining on them. And when we shine a light on something, we want to focus on it and nothing else. So, um, and it's unclear where this light is coming from. And I think that gives it a very magical quality. The next painting is called The Death of the Virgin. This painting was by far Caravaggio's, one of Caravaggio's most controversial paintings, and it was done in 1603. So when we look at this painting, whether you are aware of the stories of the Bible or not, try to put those to the side and think of this painting just as it is, and consider what impressions you have of the woman in the middle who is dying or dead. Um, what impression do you have of the colors of the painting where do your eyes dart back and forth? Um, what do you think that this woman must have been like? Uh, what do you think of the people around her? And what kind of life do you think this woman led? All of these are great questions to consider. So this painting was made um, with, uh, where Caravaggio used the model of a dead prostitute to model um, Mary, the Virgin, and he depicted her death in a very gruesome and horrifying way. Um, and he was heavily criticized for using a dead prostitute to depict someone who was so holy and sacred to the Catholic religion, which was um, the predominant religion in Italy. And these um, 
Caravaggio was criticized because not only did he model Mary after a prostitute, but he also made her look as if she's already dead. And he puts the signs of mortality on her face. Like you can see her wrinkles and her hands and her stomach looks a little bit bloated. Um, and her skin definitely looks like it's seen better days. Um, and the surroundings look very austere. There's no sign of um, angels or light from heaven that is lifting her up. Um, the, the halo around her head is just, you know, a thin golden circle. So it's it, a lot of people saw it as a disrespect toward Mary, whereas others had different ideas about it. So let's compare these two paintings. We have the death of the Virgin by uh, Virgin by Carlo Saraceni. Sorry, can't pronounce that. It's painted in 1610, and it's about the same scene. And in the second painting, you can see that there are angels who fly down to crown the Virgin and accept her into heaven. Um, just like in Caravaggio's paintings, there are, ton there are tons of people around the Virgin to say goodbye to her and who are mourning her death, but she looks very beautiful and youthful, and she looks like she's accepting her death in a very peaceful and calm way. Um, and it looks, and her death doesn't look very gruesome at all because she's just going to ascend to heaven. Whereas in Caravaggio's painting, he has not shied away from the gruesome realities of a mortal death. And I think Caravaggio's painting did something very important by reminding people of this, because I think people are sometimes in denial of the horrifying realities of our mortality, but Caravaggio has not shied away from this. And this was his realism. His realism wasn't merely in being able to depict human beings with the most accuracy to their likeness as possible. His realism was about depicting those things in reality that we don't always want to see a picture of, that we don't always want to be reminded of, such as the gruesome realities of death. And Caravaggio has chosen to paint this. So in this way, he's chosen to immortalize a type of truth that people often don't want to look at. Um, and you can consider in your opinion, which of these paintings you think is most appropriate to represent the story. Nevertheless, I think there are two important ways of representing the same story and they show different perspectives of the same idea. So whereas Caravaggio showed a literal truth, perhaps the second painting is showing a metaphysical one and both are important in different contexts of the story. So Mary's ordinary death was of great controversy with this painting. Um, and Caravaggio depicted her with all of her ugliness and her bare feet and her, uh, which was considered very um, erotic to show a woman's bare feet in a painting. Um, and she wasn't as honored in this painting as the other ones or as in previous ones, but I think she was honored in a different way. When we look at this painting, the light that's coming in from the left is shining directly on her, um, her face and it's none of the faces of the other people are visible. They're all covering their faces um, mourning her and in despair. So the light is, is coming off screen. So it kind of feels like, just like in the St. Francis of Assisi painting, it's, it's a kind of divine light that is focusing its attention. And if this painting didn't have so much darkness in it and so much despair, I think this light couldn't feel as beautiful and warm as it does, um, which is a paradox because the painting looks very dark and it looks very um, despairing, but the light makes it look almost inviting and warm as if the light is telling us that nothing bad is happening to her. It's all very natural. And uh, in like, there was a great shift in this time period as um, in medieval writing, darkness was always seen as something negative and something to be feared and abhorred. But in the Baroque era, there was a shift in the philosophy of light in general as it relates to theology, as people began to see light and began to see darkness um, and compare it as a metaphor for faith. Because if you think of enlightenment as a candle, you can only really appreciate the brilliance of a candle 
in absolute darkness. And the greater the darkness, the more you can appreciate the candle. So if we consider the candle as a metaphor for spiritual light and enlightenment, then darkness is the faith that creates the environment for that light to be appreciated. So um, this was the philosophy that explains why not only Caravaggio, but many other Baroque artists were inspired by the concept of light in their paintings and wanted to use it to, um, to enhance their stories and to tell their stories in an interesting way. Um, you'll notice this with many other artists that we'll look at throughout this cohort. Um, and it's the mortality of the people in these stories that makes them admirable because when someone with superpowers and immortality does something um, that is difficult or um, that would be very difficult for us to do, it's not as admirable because they can't die. They don't have any real consequences and therefore they aren't taking any real risks. Whereas when mortal beings do something that is very difficult to do, it's and, and they risk their lives for their values, it's all the more admirable. And this is another metaphor for why the dark and light um, symbolism is so appropriate and why Mary's surroundings were made so austere. She was just a simple, humble woman, and yet she did so much. Um, this painting is the martyrdom of St. Matthew painted in 1600. Um, and I'll just let you take a moment to look at this painting as well and appreciate how it looks kind of like a storm cloud with its composition um, or like a hurricane with this everything circling around and centering in the middle to this one moment of conflict that was immortalized in history. So this painting is about the death of this man on the bottom who's laying down St. Matthew, who was killed by a swordsman on the left-hand side, who's uh, crouching over him like a predator, about pulling up his hand to plunge his sword into St. Matthew's body. Um, and this is the moment right before his death. So it's a very horrifying painting because the I, I don't know, there's so many elements that make it horrifying. You can see the open mouth of the swordsman and you can imagine the blasphemies falling out of it on St. Matthew. St. Matthew looks absolutely vulnerable in this position um, and he can't even defend himself. There are people all around screaming and yelling um, and trying to run away, but they can't, but they also can't look away from the horrifying scene. Um, they look like they're screaming and shouting. One man has his hands pulled up, like he's reacting in horror at what he's seeing. Um, and this looks like a brawl in the street. It doesn't look like a very dignified place to be. Um, and I think that is more, that's Caravaggio's realism. He's showing what the scene would have actually looked like because it was an underground church where it happened. Um, and the youth, the swordsman who killed St. Matthew would have just been a normal miscreant. He kind of reminds you of the card sharp because he's young. So someone definitely corrupted him, and made him do their bidding. And he doesn't even realize um, what he's been caught up in. And, uh, and the, the angels on the top, the storm cloud, uh, handing St. Matthew an arrow, they kind of remind you of kids in the street who are looking out at a street fight from a window um, and are curious about it. All of the figures seem to emerge out of nowhere, just like at the St. Francis painting, uh, they seem to emerge from the darkness, like they didn't exist a moment before and they won't exist a moment after. So this takes me to my next point about this painting. Um, so the center of the painting is created by the composition. You are hyper-focused on this triangle of action in the middle where the swordsman is killing St. Matthew. And let's compare that painting to um, the Martyrdom of St. Matthew by Sebastiano Conca, which was also painted around the same time period. Um, there are so many differences between the two paintings, so I'll just let you take a moment to compare them in your mind. So when we look at these two paintings, the first thing that sticks out at us is the brightness of the painting on the left. There is so much more light in the painting, and this comes to my point about comparisons and um, 
how darkness actually helps us to focus our eyes and our attention on what matters in a story and where an artist places light uh, determines how well he is able to tell the story that he's depicting because light and contrast is what guides our eye throughout the painting. So with Sebastiano Conca's painting, your eye is taken all over the place. You're distracted by the cup on the right, how, oh, the tablecloth looks very interesting and beautiful. And then the angels distract your eyes because they look so cute. And then you have, wow, the background has these beautiful um, towers and the beautiful blue of the man on the right side jumping away. Um, there are so many little details to distract you in this painting that you lose sight of the main moment of action, which is kind of disjointed by this woman in the middle who's standing in the way, almost as if it didn't happen or she's, she can jump in in the next moment and save him. So it's kind of a false hope that he's planting into the painting, but it's not really true to the narrative. And it also takes away the horrific element that we see in Caravaggio's painting. Um, the man who is the swordsman is depicted as a Herculean uh, Greek hero with all of his bulging muscles and his pose as if he is posing particularly to get painted and not uh, on his way to kill St. Matthew. St. Matthew, on the other hand, is painted with his arms up and he looks very peaceful. He doesn't look scared at all. He looks like he is just um, going to pop into a bubble and that's how he get. that's how he dies. But that's not the reality of death, is it? And Caravaggio knows this perfectly well. So this painting exists outside of time and space. And this is thanks to the tenebrism that Caravaggio uses. Um, because the painting is so dark, it's difficult to tell the background, except for a few steps and maybe a column in the background. And so this painting could have taken place anywhere. And because of the clothes, it's also hard to tell what time period exactly it took place in. Um, this, this puts the story out of time and place and makes it contemporaneous for all people to look at. Um, people of any time period can relate to it. And, and this, I think, strikes them more dramatically when they look at this painting. And when we compare the two paintings, um, I think the most important difference is St. Matthew and the position he's in. I think the Sebastiano Conca painting makes him in more of a position of power and, uh, able, and dignity and able to defend himself. Whereas in Caravaggio's painting, St. Matthew's on, prostrated on the ground, completely at the mercy of the swordsman. And we wouldn't like to see him in this way because he's a saint. However, this is what really happened. In order for a man to be killed by another man, he has to be at his mercy. He has to be beaten by him in some significant way. And this is how the swordsman would have killed St. Matthew. Um, and it's something that we don't want to realize and we don't want to remember, just like how we don't want to think about what Mary would look like when she's dead. But it's something that Caravaggio reminds us. And as I've written here, he was never one for political correctness. Um, and he didn't care much for politeness. He preferred to be real in every sense of the word in his work. And I think this is what shocked people the most about him aside from, of course, his personal life. Another aspect that we're returning to with this painting is the culpability of the witness. So Caravaggio's painting, he usually paints himself into the painting as a character. And it's very interesting because um, some painters do that, but the way that Caravaggio does it says something about his role in his paintings. So you can see in the background, I've zoomed into it, Caravaggio running away like a bystander who uh, simultaneously wants to see the fight, but also wants to run away. And he, he feels his, he shows his face with sadness, pinching his eyebrows together and disgust at his nose, at the corner of his nose. Um, and Caravaggio is considering what it means to recreate a scene of violence. Um, when so this event would have happened once when it happened in real life but then another time when Caravaggio painted it because what by painting uh Saint Matthew's death 
he actually made it happen a second time. So in one way, Caravaggio was also St. Matthew's killer. And in this way, he feels guilt and culpability for recreating his death. But also he paints himself into the painting as a bystander who could have done something to save St. Matthew, but he didn't. And it makes us question, um, should we do something when we see a crime happening in front of us? Would you do something if you were in this scenario? And it's not a very easy question to answer um, because imagine that you are a man and you know that the swordsman could easily beat you. Would you risk your life to save St. Matthew? Would you risk getting killed yourself? Imagine that you have little children who depend on you. Would you still risk getting killed by the swordsman in order to try to save St. Matthew? Um, so these are not easy questions and it's easy to answer them in the moment in an ideal way, but it's very difficult to do that thing when you face that moment in your real life. And I think Caravaggio's paintings are so disturbing and striking to us because they remind us of our own nature and they remind us of these questions that we know uh, we might not be able to um, act in the most ideal way in that situation if we were there. So this painting is, is striking for many reasons. And this is our last painting that we'll be looking at today. It's called The Beheading of St. John. And this painting takes the, is similar to the painting um, of St. Matthew, but it takes it to a whole other level because of the poetics of blood. So just take a moment to look at this painting and form your opinion about it. And think about these questions. What features of this painting tell you that it is a Caravaggio? What does the composition of the scene being depicted um, say about the importance of the person? What's the most jarring part of this picture? And what, what is the value of placing the two, two men on the right looking out of the window? So there are many ways that we can tell this is a Caravaggio painting. Once again, it's um, shrouded in darkness and the main characters' faces are not very easily seen. Um, the most interesting part of this painting for me is how little space the entire event takes up. It's just almost, a little bit more than one quarter of the painting. And I think this reminds me of how historical events, when they occur in the moment, people don't around them don't know that it's, they're historical. They just seem like ordinary events and their importance is only revealed in posterity. Um, and I think this painting reminds us of this as there's so much empty space around the event that's happening, the killing of St. John the Baptist. Um, and also St. John himself takes up very, very little space in the painting. He is pressed down to the ground of it. And uh, the largeness of the painting makes his diminutive position seem even more deplorable and sad to look at. His skin looks like it's sallow and he's already been kind of suffering a lot. The sword that was used to cut his head was is uh, thrown to the side gleaming and the woman is getting ready to put the head on the plate. And uh, the, the man who is killing St. John has is pulling a dagger out from behind his back, getting ready to slit his head off fully so that he can put it on that plate. Um, and so we are kind of, as viewers, we are trapped in a horrifying scene between two extremely violent events, one that happened already and one that is about to happen. So by looking at this painting, we are kind of like the men on the right side of the painting who are looking out of their window. So the painter has given us someone to project ourselves onto, as many good storytellers do when they're telling a story and they want the audience to have a character that they can project onto. Um, the bystanders are not doing anything to save St. John. They're in the painting. Uh, we are also bystanders who are outside looking at this painting and we also can't do anything. Perhaps we're as helpless as those men. Um, so that's the value of putting those spectators on the side. And it's once again, the question, are we culpable when we witness a horrifying event or to what extent are we culpable? Um, 
And the, the fact that he makes this painting shrouded in darkness with just a man's, um, the killer's back covered in light and as well as St. John the Baptist and the red uh, scarf that mimics blood covering his body. It's the light is telling us what to focus on and it helps to sharpen the story so that we know what the narrative is of the painting and our eyes are not darting all over the place looking at everything. Um, see the light on the forehead of the spectator on the side draws our eyes to it so that we notice that he's there. The most interesting part of this painting, of course, is how uh, Michelangelo Maurici de Caravaggio signed his name in blood. So uh, paint is magical because it can turn into many things. So Caravaggio used paint to create blood. And through, through the same alchemy of paint, he turned that blood back into ink when he used it to sign his name at the bottom of this painting. So he has signed his name in St. John the Baptist's blood. And there are two possible reasons that he did this or two possible interpretations of it. Both are very interesting. So um, the first, of course, is that he wanted to be, he always coveted aristocracy, but at the same time, he loathed it. So he wanted to show that his bloodline was also just as noble as, as that of any knight. Um, and he, by signing his name with St. John the Baptist's blood, he's saying that he descends from all of these saints as well because um, they are part of the same faith that he's a part of. And so for that reason, he can claim heritage with them. And that is more important than any heraldic noble heritage that is used to select knights. Um, the second meaning uh, is as a death note. So it's a very old trope in storytelling that a dying man will sign his name and sign the name of his killer in blood next to his body as he's dying. And uh, this happens in um, Sherlock Holmes. It happens in noir films. It happens in other points in history. And things that are signed in blood are usually more binding and more true, just like how when Faust signs his name in blood when he's signing his soul away. So St. John seems to suggest that it was Caravaggio who really killed him. And knowing that Caravaggio was accused of murder in real life, this takes on dramatic new meanings. The guilt of his crimes seems to plague the artist. This is similar to the St. Matthew painting where um, Caravaggio feels somehow guilty for, for St. Matthew's death as well. Um, and this could be one because he recreated the death by painting it but two, because he's probably, he might be projecting guilt of the murder that he committed in real life onto the painting and the characters in it. Um, just like with the Mary painting, St. John doesn't look in good shape here. Um, it looks like a horrifying depiction of what death really looks like. And Caravaggio wants us to look at it. He doesn't want us to look away. He wants us to remember what real life is. And, um, I think that's part of the macabre tradition that gives us things like the Godfather, um, Scarface, Edgar Allan Poe, all of these artists who didn't shy away from the shadow of mankind and the, hor uh, the horrifying realities that we are capable of. Um, and this is a painting that we'll be looking at next time, but that's all the paintings that we'll be looking at today for Caravaggio. And I hope to see you next week in the art club. Thank you for listening.